continue working through our series in the book of Romans. And if you have your Bibles or if you want to open your devices and go to your Bible apps and turn with me to Romans chapter 6, that's where we're going to be this evening. And as uh, we've been working through this book, this is a, an epistle, a letter written by the Apostle Paul, and he is writing to the house churches in Rome, and he's writing to these Christians who are new converts to the faith, and Paul has never actually met them. So what he's doing is he's giving them a more in-depth teaching on the gospel itself, explaining to them how they can come to um, access God's righteousness in their own lives, how they can be declared or justified in God's sight. And so what Paul explains at the very beginning is that we access God's righteousness by faith. It's from faith to faith, it says. The just shall live by faith. And he goes on to explain that the reason that we can only access God's righteousness through faith is because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, meaning we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of perfection. Where God is perfect in his glory, we all miss the mark. And so what he does is he makes a pretty in-depth case for both the Gentiles and then later the Jews, explaining how the Gentiles have all sinned against God. And then he goes to explain how the Jews, even though they have received the law or the Old Testament, they even have failed to completely fulfill and obey the law. And so he shows how the law was meant to actually show us our sin rather than to justify us. Rather, we are saved by the grace of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. And so he even makes one more case in the Old Testament looking at Abraham, who would have been like the prime example for Israel, who would have been like the most righteous guy that they could have named. And so they were looking at Abraham, and he says even Abraham was justified by faith. And so he explains that's how we all will be able to access God's righteousness, is by trusting in what Christ did for us on the cross. And so he gives some more in-depth understanding or explanation of what exactly was going on on the cross. So we talked about these different words, right? Justification. We talked about redemption. We talked about propitiation. All of these different facets that Jesus is accomplishing for us on the cross. And then what we saw last week was we looked at, now that we've kind of explained that there's, we are justified by faith in Christ, by God's grace, we now looked at the blessings of justification as well as the basis for our justification. And the blessings we looked at is showing that there are certain things that we can actually experience right now as Christians who are declared righteous in the eyes of God. And so we saw that we have peace with God. We saw that we have access with God. It says that we have salvation and confidence or hope in God. We have the love of God. All of these wonderful blessings that come with being justified. Then likewise we saw how the basis for our justification comes from the fact that we had once Adam and Eve in the garden, and Adam, being the first human, he was our federal head or representative for all of humanity. And so when Adam was given the command not to eat of the forbidden tree, when he rebelled, he acted on our, our behalf. And because of that, it affected all of humanity. So we all now allow death to enter the world because of sin entering the world. So now we all as humans, because we were under Adam or in Adam, we all have then experienced spiritual and physical death where we have um, a, a depraved nature, where we continue to follow in the footsteps of Adam, where we all sin, and then likewise we all end up physically dying at some point in our lives. But because of Christ, him coming on the cross and then resurrecting from the dead, he offers us a new life. He offers us a new representative where Jesus says you can either be an Adam and let him be your representative before God, or you can choose a new federal head, a new representative in Jesus Christ. And if you do that, you are given no longer sin and death, but righteousness and eternal life. And so that's kind of where he ended last time at the end of chapter 5. And so what we're going to be looking at tonight in chapter 6 is basically Paul addressing some um, potential questions that his readers would probably have in their mind after they've been hearing everything that Paul has been saying. Because they're hearing this repetitive theme of you are saved or you're justified. You get God's righteousness accredited to your account. All you have to do is basically say, I believe, I trust in you. And so there's a lot of these potential questions that they may have thinking to themselves, so is, is Paul anti-law or is Paul for sinning and maybe the antinomianism lifestyle, which basically means you can live however you want? Is that basically what Paul's teaching? You just trust in God and then live however you want to live and, it's, and you're fine, you get to go to heaven? Um, so he, he, he's expecting some of these questions to arise. And so what we're going to see in verse 1 
And in verse 15 tonight, there are basically two questions that kind of break the chapter up into two thoughts. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take it in two um, different um, sections tonight. We're going to read verses, uh, verses 1 to 14, and then we're going to just break it down a little bit, and then we're going to read verses 15 to 23, and then break that down. So let's first uh, look at the first half in verses, uh, verses 1 to 14. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, who die to sin, live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So, as I said at the very beginning of chapter 6 and verse 1, Paul asks this hypothetical question that he's expecting, where he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So he's, he's bringing this question up because just previously he explained that with the giving of the law, sin started to grow and increase. But he said even though there's even this greater sin because of the revelation of God's law, God's grace abounds. It is greater than even our sin. And so basically he explains that with greater sin, there becomes even more grace. And so the question then that he's expecting them to say is, so you're saying since there's more sin, there's more grace. And since there's more grace, there's more glory to God. So therefore, should we just continue to sin so that grace may abound? That's basically what they're asking. Should we sin so that God's grace will abound? And so what he explains and how he answers this, which is very similar in verse 2, as well as a response to the, the later question that we'll read in, um, in verses 15 and 16. But he responds by saying, certainly not. Or I know some people's translations may say, God forbid, and I think that's maybe even a better um, rendering of really the emphasis that Paul's making. He's saying that that is a silly notion to have, to think that because of God giving us grace, we should then go and live sinful lives. And so he's going to explain why that is. And so what he does in verses 2 to 7 is he says or explains that when we were being justified, we were being justified for a purpose. And we are being justified unto sanctification. And that word's not in the text, and I'm going to break it down a little bit of what that, what that means. But as we looked before, justification, it's a term, a legal term, that means that we are declared righteous. So if we just think about salvation here, this is our journey as Christians in, the, in redemption history as we come to know Christ to all the way to the eternal state where we're in heaven with Christ. So we have salvation, right? And we look at justification. That's what Paul's really been emphasizing, how we are declared righteous when we trust in God. So as soon as we say, Jesus, I trust what you did on the cross for you. I believe that you died and rose from the dead. You are immediately declared righteous by God. But then there's something else known as sanctification, and that word means to become sanctified or to become set apart or, or holy. And so what sanctification is, it's the process in which that we are growing in righteousness. And so this is what justification is meant to lead us to. When we are forgiven of our sins, we are given the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does is he actually empowers us 
to actually live out a righteous life. So we actually are empowered to grow and to actually live righteously. Not, our, not only are we just declared righteous and then we live however we want, rather, we're actually empowered to live out a righteous life. And then finally, glorification is where we finally, whenever Christ either returns or whenever we die and then we go to be with Christ, that is when we are made righteous. That is where we are completely sinless because we have now seen the beatific vision or we have seen the glory of God for ourselves. So we are made and transformed completely new. And so as we're kind of just looking at, so your justification is declared righteous, sanctification, you're growing in righteousness, and glorification, you are finally made perfect or you are made righteous. Another way that you can kind of think about this in relation to sin is that justification is salvation from the penalty of sin. So we will no longer, because, of, because we are justified, we no longer have to worry about being punished for our sins. Sanctification is salvation from the power of sin, how there is this power that weighs us down and tempts us. Rather, because of sanctification, we are actually able to, able to overcome the power of sin. And then finally, glorification is salvation from the presence of sin. And that is our final hope when we are with Christ, is that there will no longer be sin ever to exist. It will no longer reign or be present in our daily lives. Because as we are declared righteous, we know that there are times that we still have to battle righteous and, and sinful inclinations, but then glorification will be that time where we no longer will have to struggle with this battle of the spirit and flesh. And so I bring all of this up to say the emphasis that Paul is going to be making tonight is, is number two, sanctification. How when we are justified, we are then go, being justified unto sanctification, or we being justified unto growing in righteousness. Because what Paul does here is he explains that when we trusted or placed our faith in Christ, what that resulted in is us being dead to sin. It says that you died to sin when you trusted Christ. And sometimes maybe we don't always think about it because we, we think of Jesus giving us life, which is true. He does in the gospel, but there's also in one sense a death that is occurring when we trust Christ. There's a death of the old man that we're going to look at a little bit in this text. So what he explains, and he kind of uses an illustration to explain how we die to sin, and he uses baptism as his illustration. And there are scholars that kind of differ on whether or not Paul is specifically thinking or referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as in referred to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, or if this is specifically referring to water baptism. And I think, really, Paul probably has both in mind here. He's probably um, thinking about both and understanding that his audience probably is recognizing and understanding that there's both of these things going on here. The, the reality of what the Spirit is doing internally, right, where it is actually bringing us into the body of Christ, as well as the water baptism, where we are actually seeing it demonstrated or, or signifying what is happening. Because we know with, the, with baptism, what happens, you have a, a person who is in the water, and then they go and they are immersed, or they are buried in the water, right? So they are basically buried like someone that would be dead, and then they are brought back up out of the water, and so what that is to signify is that we are dying to our old lives, and then we are rising anew to a new life. And so what Paul is explaining you, with the illustration of baptism is that whenever we chose to trust in Christ, we were dying to sin, and we were identifying ourselves with Christ. So when Christ is on the cross dying, we are actually identifying with him. We're saying, this is my life now. I am giving that to Christ to die on the cross for us. But likewise, baptism doesn't end with you in the water, right? Because if it did, we'd all physically die, right? If we all stayed in the water. But there's that ending result of, and also they, they rise. And so what it's saying is because we are identifying with Christ in our baptism, we not only get to associate with his death, but we also get to associate with what happens after, which is his resurrection. So what he's saying is when we are baptized into Christ, we are identifying with both his death and his resurrection. And so what we see then is when we come to Christ, the old man, which the old man that he's referencing here is the old us, who we were before we knew Jesus. So that would have been the sinful person, the ungodly person, the person that didn't care about God, that didn't honor God, didn't, didn't want to serve him. All of the mistakes and past that we had before we came to Jesus, that person who you were 
They are dead on the cross when Jesus dies on the cross. And so we see some um, biblical examples of what this is being described with, um, with Jesus even saying in Matthew 16. This is verses uh, 24 to 25. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So that's actually what's happening whenever we come to trust in Christ and whenever we receive the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and what we see signified in water baptism is it's actually us following Christ, but by following him, what we have to do is we have to die. To have life, we have to die to our old selves. We cannot be the same person we were before Christ. There has to be a change. There has to be a transformation. Likewise, we see in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, which this is also the Apostle Paul who's writing this book. He also wrote Galatians. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to make it very, very clear to us that when we say we want to follow Christ, when we say we, we have faith in Christ, that means that we have given up our old lives. We've given up our past, and we're saying we are fully committed to living for Christ. We're living for him. And we can do this because of what we just said previously, that we have associated or identified with his resurrection. So not only have we died to our old self, our old life, our, our old man, it says, but we actually are resurrected people. So there's a, a future resurrection that we look forward to as believers, right, which, which results in our glorification. But there's also a resurrection that you as a believer right now experience. If you have followed Christ and died to your old life, the text promises, it, it reassures that you have been resurrected from the dead spiritually. You have been raised from the dead spiritually, and we see this in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Likewise, in Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So he's really just laboring this point, giving an illustration through baptism to say that if you want to associate with Christ, you get all of the blessings that are associated with Christ. You get to die to your old life. It's gone. It's been crucified with him. And now that past is gone. And now you are actually resurrected from the dead because he has resurrected from the dead. And now because you have resurrected, you have received the Holy Spirit sealing you. And then because of that, as we see in verses 8 to 14, then the promise given to us because of that, now that we have died and we have resurrected, it says that we are no longer dominated by the power of sin. If you associate with Jesus, what did Jesus do? He conquered sin and death. So if you say, I follow Christ, I associate, I identify with Christ, what that means is you now have been empowered to be over. You, you are able to conquer both sin and death. We are no longer under the dominion of sin is what it's being described here. It's, it's really basically describing kind of two kingdoms. It's talking about the reign of sin, and then you have the reign of Christ or the reign of obedience and righteousness. But what he, he goes on and says, Though he gives us this promise in saying we are, we are no longer dominated by the power of sin, he does show us that that means that we are to live it out. Not just hear it hypothetically, but actually it says to reckon it. That means to basically actually act it or live it out. Actually purchase and, and take hold of what God has promised to be true. So if we are no longer slaves to sin, then that means that we must no longer allow it to reign or rule in our lives. You know, sometimes we think to ourselves, well, I'm a sinner. And so therefore, basically, we just throw it up and say, well, God gives us grace. And we think that it's no big deal. But what he's emphasizing here is though grace is always available to us as sinners, we aren't to just throw that out and say, oh, I'm a sinner and just let it be an excuse. Rather, we are called to conquer, to overcome our sin, to overcome our temptations. In fact, we actually get this promise in 1 Corinthians 
chapter 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. See, this is the difference between us before Christ and us with Christ. When we've gotten the spirit, when we have become justified, we are starting to grow in our holiness, grow in righteousness to where we actually are given the way of escape. There will never be a sin or a temptation in your life that God is not able to get you over, to get you through, to give you a way of escape. So any time that we do sin, which we all will, because until we are glorified, we will still battle the flesh. But the thing is, every single battle can be won. This is the difference. Every battle that we face, spiritually speaking, can be won if we yield to the Spirit, if we believe what we saw Christ do on the cross and through his resurrection. He overcame these things, and we are now given the ability to rule over sin rather than to be subjected to sin. So we need to then view ourselves, I think, not as being freed to sin, as the question might be asking. We're not freed to sin, but we are freed from sin sin. That's how we should understand the grace that is being available to us. It's not that we got grace, so therefore we can sin. It's we have been freed from it. So that's how we should understand grace. And so he then sums it up here at the end of the first section by explaining that all of our body, our minds, it says that our our mouths, our ears, our eyes, our feet, all of these instruments that God has given us, we are to actually utilize them for the kingdom of God. We are to utilize them for righteousness. So this is the promise. If you were in Christ, you're not only justified, but you're also being sanctified, being made holy and righteous. And because of this gift, you are then to make the choice of are you going to utilize your instruments, your body, your life for one of these two kingdoms? Are you going to use it for the reign of sin or for the reign of righteousness? And that's kind of what he's going to move into now as we look at um, these two different camps being a slave to sin or being a slave to God in verses 15 to 23. So let's read this then. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are the ones slaves from who you obey or whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that that form of the doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord." So in verse 15, as as he did at the very beginning of verse 1, he asks this hypothetical question again. And and what he's asking here is, if we are under grace, which is what he just said, we are under grace, not the law. He says, if we are under grace and no longer under the law, does that mean that we can basically live however we want? Can we, are we free to to sin or free to live uh, however we please? And he responds once again, the same way, certainly not, or as I said, God forbid, And so what he then goes on to explain because of this, similar to what he just said before, in verses 16 to 20, he says that there is no middle ground that we have to choose from in our lives. There's no middle ground between being a slave to sin or a slave to obedience. Every single one of us are one of those. It's not, are you a slave or are you going to be a slave? It's, which slave are you? 
and he, and he even explains this. The reason he's using the term slavery here is not to endorse or say, hey, slavery is really, really good. He says that I'm using this in human terms so you can kind of understand the concept of what you're being under. Who, who are you letting lord over you or lead you in your life? If you're following Christ, that would be letting him be your, your leader, your lord, right? So he's using this in human terms for us to kind of understand what he's explaining here. And so what he, he goes on to say is you're going to serve one of them based on your choices. And this goes back to you can't serve two masters, as Jesus says. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says this. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And now, in the context, he's referring specifically to serving God or serving wealth or materials. But I think the concept still applies here. There are two kingdoms, the kingdom of sin and the kingdom of God or the kingdom of righteousness. And what we choose to do with our lives, what we choose to do with our instruments that God has given us, it will reveal who we are slaves to. Because it explains that whatever you yield to becomes your master. Whatever you bow your knee to, give your time, give your effort, give your heart to, that becomes your master. And so what he's saying is if we want to say that we have grace now, and now that we are freed, how do we want to live out our freedom and we go back to sin, what it reveals is that we really want to be enslaved to sin. We really want to be mastered by sin. But what he goes on to explain is that if you are a slave of righteousness, it goes completely contradictory to the plan of God to just go back and be enslaved to sin. He says these are two different camps here. You can't be a slave to righteousness and want to go back under the slave of sin. So he's saying that it's so clear that these are two different categories and you have to choose one. And whatever you're doing, whatever you're choosing, that reveals your heart. So what we see then is that grace, it does not become an excuse for us to sin. Rather, it gives us a reason to obey, a reason to live righteously because we have been enslaved to righteousness. And so he then concludes this chapter in verses 21 to 23 by explaining the result of the two. So he's, he's basically explained, hey, God's given you this gift of justification leading to sanctification, putting to death the sins of the world because we are identified with Christ. And then he says we no longer have to be dominated or under the dominion of sin and death because of this great reward. And now we, we choose between the two. But here's the thing. Now, after you have made your choice, this is what happens. And so he, he basically explains how, how sin, what happens there, it merits death. The wages of sin is death, right? So if you're basically, if you're working for your master, sin, that basically they're personifying sin here. If sin is your master and you want to work for him, the wages, what you're going to earn, is death. And what that death means is not only physical death are you going to die, but you're also going to experience the second death, which is eternal conscious torment in hell or the lake of fire. That's what he's saying here. That's what serving under sin does. If you want to live that lifestyle, you can do it. But there's going to be a consequence, and that's death. That's what the wages there are. And so what he explains is, if you were a slave who was set free from that master, who would in their right mind want to go back under that master? Because that's what the master is going to offer you. He's offering you abuse and death. And so what he's saying is, if you have the option on the table, if you can choose one or the other, what he's saying is he's saying choose God, because what God gives, as we see in verse 23, it's God offers us a free gift in Christ, and what that gift is is everlasting life. That's not just you live forever physically, right, because, or I'm sorry, spiritually, but what it also is saying is that we will live life and have it abundantly, the best type of life, the best quality of life. So what is really on the table is no choice at all. It's do you want to be enslaved to what Jesus has already freed you from that's going to lead in the wages of, of sin being death? Or do you, do you want to live out a righteous, holy life that honors God because he's already offered you and given you life and he's promising you all of these wonderful things? So which one do you want to be enslaved by? The one who loves you and serves you and is good to you or the one that abuses you and, and leads to death? So that's basically what he's explaining to us. So when we truly come to understand grace, we should want to live it out accordingly. That's really the, the, the summary of this whole section is when we understand the true grace of God, it should result in us wanting to live for God, wanting to live righteous, not wanting to live in sin or, or live any way we want. We want to live for the one who gave us grace. So that's what he's explaining here. So if you're truly justified, you want to grow in righteousness. You want to become more and more like the one who saved you. And so I, I want to just close with this um, quote by G.C. 
Burkauer, where he says, the essence of Christian theology is grace, and the essence of Christian ethics is gratitude. And I think this really um, is helpful for what Paul is really trying to say in this chapter. He's saying that when we com- conceptualize and understand the, ma- the main Christian ethic or the main Christian um, theology, it's all about grace. It's all about understanding God's goodness and His grace given to the world. And then our response, our ethic, how we live, it should all be gratitude. When you understand God's grace, you have a, gra- a gracious, a, grat- a heart of gratitude that wants to just obey it and submit to his leadership. And I think that's really what Paul's saying. When you understand God's grace, you want to live it out in gratitude. 